Hello, everyone. Thanks for waking up and being here early with us. Um, so this talk is just meant to go over some useful tips I've learned along the way. Um, here are my disclosures. Um, so first up, nutritional deficits, um, which are very prevalent in the IBD patient population. Decreased nutritional intake and increased losses occur as a result of many factors. Um, so small bowel resection and or disease small bowel is a big, is a big one for nutritional deficits. Um, ileal Crohn's disease um, is a very common place to have Crohn's disease. And typically, if you do have active disease in that area, you're more at risk of um, being deficient in certain vitamins, especially vitamin B12. Um, also, increased energy expenditure during flares, blood loss during flares, certain medications such as methotrexate or sulfasalazine, which can cause a deficiency in folic acid, so we usually have them take a, a folate supplement with those medications. Certain restrictive diets, bacterial overgrowth, um, and then also, you know, the most common deficiencies I mentioned, B12, which is very important to check in patients that have had an ileal resection or have ileal disease. Um, also the folic acid levels, vitamins A, E, K, vitamin D. I'm not sure about down here in Florida, but our patients up in Chicago have, have very prevalent vitamin D deficiencies, so we check for that quite frequently. Also, you want to check iron, zinc, calcium. Um, in my patients that have ostomies, I typically usually will also check phosphate and magnesium levels. Um, and if your patient has small bowel disease, I'll usually even check a copper and maybe selenium too. Um, so you want to make sure you're checking for these vitamin and mineral deficiencies routinely. Um, in my practice, I would say that if somebody has ileal Crohn's disease, I'm checking these levels at least annually, maybe even more so if they have a known deficiency. Um, and then in a patient with ulcerative colitis, I usually at least annually will check iron studies and vitamin D. And you can also collaborate with your dietitian for um, supplement recommendations as needed. Steroids. Um, so these are obviously used a lot in inflammatory bowel disease. There's different types, oral, parenteral, topical, um, unfocused release, such as prednisone or hydrocortisone, and then the focus release, um, such as budesonide, which is really set to release at that targeted site of inflammation. Benefits of steroids, of course, that they usually work really well and really quickly in patients that are pretty sick. Um, and they're used to induce a remission. So when your patient's ill and you want them getting feeling better quickly, they're a great choice. However, they have many, many drawbacks, which is why we only use them to induce a remission and not to maintain a remission. They have many short-term and long-term side effects, and in some cases, you may need to wean off them slowly um, in order for your adrenal glands to kick in and start working again. So some tips that you can keep in mind when using steroids. So if you can use budesonide, then do it. Um, typically, it'll work in more of a mild or moderate flare instead of those really severely ill patients. But if you're not sure, you can always give them a trial of budesonide. And if they don't improve or get better, then go to something like prednisone from there. Um, also, in patients with distal disease, so your patients with distal ulcerative colitis or even um, colonic Crohn's disease, always make sure that you're thinking, can I use topical you know, foam therapies or enemas in this patient um, instead of oral, which has that systemic effect. Make sure that when you are giving them steroids that you have a maintenance medication plan in hand. So if it's somebody that has required, you're looking back in their chart when you're talking to them on the phone and they've required steroids three times in the last year and their maintenance medication has stayed the same, then you probably need to up that maintenance medicine because it's not working anymore. Um, if you're using steroids in your patients, make sure that you're monitoring for bone health. Um, so some patients, uh, some providers say that when you're giving a steroid prescription, you should also be giving another prescription for calcium and vitamin D, um, as well as a prescription for a new maintenance medication. You want to make sure you're checking vitamin D levels annually, and also DEXA scans in patients with steroid use greater than three months. And in patients with really long-term steroid use, make sure that you're having them see an eye doctor for a thorough eye exam. Metronidazole. So there are some different uses for this um, in inflammatory bowel disease patients. Um, sometimes you will see it used to prevent recurrence of Crohn's disease, status post and ileal resection. Usually if um, providers I work with use metronidazole in this way, they'll use it for a three-month course. Um, right after surgery, and then they usually rescope at that time. 
Um, it's also used pretty prevalently in uh, perianal Crohn's disease. Um, C. diff infections, although I will say that our patients, they don't really respond well to metronidazole for C. diff. It doesn't really rid the infections in them quite as well anymore, so we've kind of gotten away from that. Um, and also in patients that have an ileal J pouch and suffer from pouchitis. Metronidazole does have some known side effects. Um, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of appetite. A pretty common one is that metallic taste in their mouth, which patients hate. Headache, discolored urine. Um, and also the big one there is the peripheral neuropathy. So that's associated with long-term use. So if your patient is one of those that requires chronic antibiotics for a perianal disease or pouchitis or whatever the case may be, we actually try not to use metronidazole long-term because they can develop the permanent peripheral neuropathy. Um, so then we would try to give them Cipro or something similar instead. Um, there's some contraindications there. So they may increase levels of warfarin. It's contraindicated in pregnancy during the first trimester. And you cannot drink alcohol when you're taking metronidazole. So how to tell the difference between an IBD flare versus infectious colitis? Um, so let's say your patient calls the office complaining of abdominal cramping, low-grade fever, and diarrhea. How do you determine if it's an IBD flare or a C. diff infection? So this is when the nurses who are triaging the calls um, come in hand. So you want to make sure you're asking the right questions. A lot of times if your patient has had IBD for years, they know what a flare feels like, and they can tell you right away, yep, this is a flare. It happens every time. And sometimes they might say, no, this is different. Something's not right. Um, you also want to ask about recent antibiotic exposure, recent travel, known infectious exposures, or if they've had C. diff in the past, because that puts them at more at risk of developing it again. So if they answer yes to um, the bottom four questions, then you should be um, checking a stool sample to rule out infection. We do have a GI stool panel, which checks for about 15 to 20 viral and bacterial um, infections, which is really great. If you don't have the GI stool panel, you can check for a C. diff, stool culture, O&P, and maybe stain for a cryptosporidium and giardia. You want to make sure that you're educating patients on good hand hygiene to prevent the spread of bacteria to other family members. Um, and if they're going into the office to submit a stool sample, you can also um, get labs at that time, see if they're dehydrated, if they have a low potassium level, if they're having a lot of diarrhea. Obviously, if they're positive for infection, you want to treat that infectious pathogen. Um, if C. diff is positive, we typically first line um, will use vancomycin um, or also even fidaxomycin first line over the metronidazole. Um, if negative for infection, this is when we would probably do a trial of steroids to see if their patient's symptoms improve and then review the maintenance medication. If their symptoms are still refractive, you might want to get them in quick um, for a flex sig to rule out other infections such as CMV. And if they're still not getting better, then admit them for IV steroids and further workup. We do have a rule at U of C where we don't admit anyone for a flare unless we rule out infection first. Um, therapeutic drug monitoring. So what is it? Um, dose adjustment and titration based on serum drug concentrations, antibodies, and enzyme activity. So in thiopurines, uh, TPMT is the primary enzyme for metabolizing azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine. So you would check this before starting either of those medications to see how well the patient breaks down the medication. About 90% of patients have a normal TPMT, and you can dose it regularly. About 10% of patients have an intermediate activity, which we still will use azathioprine or 6-MP in these patients, but you have to be very careful with it, and we usually start them on a really low dose, like 25 milligrams a day, and check labs pretty routinely. And then um, about 0.3% of patients have a negligible enzyme activity, and we do not use these medications in those patients. Um, once your patient is on the medication, um, you can then check thiopurine metabolite levels, which check a 6-thioguanine, um, which is the active drug level in the patient's um, system. So you're going to kind of want to shoot between 235 and 400. Anything above 400 can cause a drop in um, a white blood cell count. Um, and then the 6-MMP, if that level is above 5,700, it can cause elevation in liver function tests. 
Um, it's also helpful to see if your patient is actually taking the medicine. So if they're, they say that they're taking three tabs of azathioprine a day and you check metabolite levels and the 6-TG is less than 50, most likely they're not taking the medication. Um, but this is not a substitute for, for your regular labs that you need. You still need to do CBCs and LFTs. Typically in our practice, we do them two to three weeks after starting the medication, two to three weeks after every dose increase, and once they're on a good stable dose, we typically will check them every three to four months. Methotrexate and IBD. Um, so this is also used as maintenance therapy in Crohn's disease. And it's the third immunomodulator. So I just talked about azathioprine and 6-MP. So if your patient has that negligible enzyme activity and they can't take azathioprine or 6-MP or they're allergic to it, then methotrexate might be an option for them. Um, it's also used in combination with biologics to prevent immunogenicity. It's commonly used in the PEDS population, I think, just because of the lymphoma risk that's associated with thiopurines. Um, and it's also a good choice for patients with concomitant arthritis. So if you notice, I'm sure a lot of you have patients that also might have rheumatoid arthritis. Um, rheumatologists use a lot of um, methotrexate in their practice. It works well for joint pain. So it can be either given orally or sub-Q, but it's a once-a-week dosing. Um, typically, in the studies we did at U of C, the Crohn's patients, they tolerated and had better response to the sub-Q um, over the oral but you can still use either. Um, the dosing is 7.5 to 25 milligrams once a week, and again, you need to use that daily folic acid um, supplement in these patients. There are side effects associated with methotrexate, commonly nausea, headache, flu-like symptoms, so usually our patients prefer to take this on, let's say, a Saturday when they're not going into the office because they might be feeling not that great for a few hours. You can also um, give them some on on diancitron and acetaminophen beforehand. Um, if it is pregnancy category X, so if your patient is of childbearing age um, and they want to get pregnant in the near future, then we do not use methotrexate. And if they are of childbearing age but they have no plans of getting pregnant, we still recommend that they use two forms of birth control to prevent pregnancy while on this medication. And also you have to limit alcohol use. Uh, American College of Rheumatology says no more than one to two drinks per week as it can cause hepatotoxicity. Surgery and IBD. So bowel surgery may be necessary and it's actually kind of prevalent um, in the IBD population. Anywhere from 50 to 80% of patients with Crohn's disease will require surgery, whereas about a third of patients with ulcerative colitis will. Um, so you want to make sure that you're addressing the surgery option with your patients and you're not leaving it to the last resort. Um, it should be talked about early on so that patients can make a better informed decision about what's best for them, for their lifestyle, um, moving forward. You also need to recognize when enough is enough. So we all have those really tough patients that just seem to never get better, or they have a reaction to every medicine that you give them. Um, so surgery is probably something that should be talked about um, early on. It often requires multiple conversations um, before they can really come to terms with it. And also patients that are not compliant with medical therapy. We also have a lot of patients that just don't take their medications on time or as prescribed kind of setting themselves up for failure, um, but maybe they don't want to take medication and surgery is a better option for them. When patients express a decreased quality of life, despite optimized medical management or refusal of medical treatment, often surgery can offer an improved quality of life, so please keep that in mind. And when patients with a permanent ileostomy and patients with the ileal J pouch were asked about quality of life, both groups reported a similar good quality of life. So again, um, the decision should be made on what's best for the patient and their lifestyle. Um, next up, we have pain medicines in IBD. So this is kind of taboo, just like steroids. Um, the main thing here is that it should not be used routinely in inflammatory bowel disease. Yes, it, there are some appropriate uses. So let's say your patient is is very sick, they're refractive to medications, they just had a bowel obstruction, or they have a, you know, a long segment of stricture in their small bowel and they're scheduled for surgery, yes, they might need some pain medicine to get them through until surgery is scheduled. And also, postoperatively, while those surgical wounds are healing, yes, pain management is definitely important and appropriate at that time. 
And of course, your patients with perianal disease. So if they have a, a pretty bad fistula or they just required an IND, or let's say they have a CTON in place, um, that, and they're going into the office to get it tightened, um, those are definitely times when pain medicine is appropriate. You just want to make sure that you're telling your patient that, and you're not just refilling pain medicine every month with their other medications. If they're requiring that much pain medicine, it's probably because their maintenance medicine is not working enough to keep their IBD in remission. Um, you also want to make sure that you're avoiding NSAIDs in our patient population. So NSAIDs, the overuse can cause gastritis, gastric ulcers. It can also mimic um, small bowel Crohn's disease. So make sure that the NSAID use is, is limited, if any at all. Um, acetaminophen is preferred. If it's ineffective, tramadol is also an acceptable option that we will use. And don't forget about antispasmodics such as hyoscyamine, um, which can be used for cramping. Um, if you do have to use narcotics, make sure that you limit and monitor their use. Do not give any prescriptions with refills. That's something that I do in my practice. Um, and refer to a pain specialist when appropriate. Um, I would also say in those patients that do require narcotics, let's say pre or post surgery, I usually have the surgical team take care of those refills. I'm not gonna refill them too because they might end up with duplicate prescriptions and that causes a problem right there. Um, so again, if your patient is requiring frequent pain medicine, then reevaluate their maintenance medication plan. And lastly, flare prevention in IBD. So um, right now, holidays are coming up. That can be a stressful time. Sometimes that can trigger a flare. So you want to make sure that you're educating your patient on things that can cause flares, such as lapses in taking medication or incorrect dosing of medication. Um, and you really kind of have to ask your patients these questions. They're really not that forthcoming with this information. Um, also, it's the time of year. January's coming up soon. They might get new insurance. Let's say they don't tell you they're getting new insurance until after their dose of medication is due, and then that creates a lapse in medication, which can cause a flare. So you want to address these issues before they happen, if possible. Also, the recent or prolonged loose or use of certain medications, such as NSAIDs, as I spoke about, or antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are okay to use if there's a documented infection, but I think the problem is that some of our patients don't see a primary care doctor. They might just go to an urgent care clinic, and they repeatedly get antibiotics for maybe you know a runny nose or allergy-like symptoms. So um, we try not to use antibiotics unless there's a documented source of infection. Uh, patient education is key. You want to make sure that you instruct patients to maintain compliance with medication, as well as follow a well-balanced diet, limit stress, stop smoking, especially in our Crohn's disease patients. And then also, you know, all of our patients, well, pretty much all of them, have cell phones now or smartphones. They can download apps, um, kind of keep track of their symptoms, be proactive in their own health. <laughs> Uh, the CCF has a flare symptom tracker, which is really helpful. That way they can see if there's been spikes of disease activity in the last couple weeks. Then maybe even if they're not feeling that poorly, they can call and talk to you about it and say, hey, you know, I noticed the last couple weeks I've been having a few more bowel movements, a little bit more urgency. Let's talk about it. Let's see what we can do to kind of nip this in the bud before it gets worse. Thank you.